Reverend Dr. Chris Antal. I'd like to present on the topic this morning of good morning, good morning. And uh, I'd like to start with some scripture readings. Uh, Old Testament and New Testament. So if you'd open your Bibles, please. You didn't bring it. Well, I brought mine, so don't worry. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 5. Now, it is Old Testament. I know what you're thinking. It's not the Old Testament, but 2,000 years is still pretty old. So. so this is the Old Testament reading. And some of you may have heard these words before. It's a rather famous sermon from Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount. It starts in chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's our Old Testament reading, and now, for our New Testament reading, if you would take out your DSM-5 from the American Psychiatric Association. <laughs> this is the gospel according to the American Psychiatric Association. And I'm going to paraphrase a bit. This is from their latest edition on prolonged grief disorder. And it goes something like this. Blessed are not those whose grief is characterized by incapacitating feelings. Blessed are not those whose mourning is symptomed, symptomatic with identity disruption. Blessed are not those whose grief is marked by a sense of disbelief about death. Blessed are not those who struggle with avoidance of reminders of the person who's dead. Blessed are not those who suffer intense emotional pain related to the death. Blessed are not those who have difficulty moving on with life. Blessed are not those who have emotional numbness, feeling that life is meaningless or intense loneliness. Blessed are not, for theirs is not the kingdom of heaven, theirs is a diagnosis that is now called prolonged grief disorder. Now, I'm being playful here, and I have esteemed colleagues who are psychiatrists, and there's a place for disorder and diagnosis in my worldview. But the recent decision by the American Psychiatric Association to make prolonged grief disorder their newest diagnosis has been met with some debate. The president of the APA, Vivian Pender, said this on the announcement of this new revised DSM guide. The circumstances in which we are living with more than 675,000, this was in September, we've now passed mega death in the United States, over a million dead, may make prolonged grief disorder more prevalent. And the APA notes not only the deaths of COVID, but the grief from ongoing wars, the wind down in Afghanistan, 
floods, fires, hurricanes, and an unprecedented amount of gun violence in the United States are all contributing factors to what they are now identifying as a prolonged grief disorder. The APA says this, in prolonged grief disorder, the bereaved individual may experience intense longings for the deceased or preoccupation with thoughts of the deceased or in children and adolescents with circumstances around the death. Now these grief reactions occur most of the day, nearly every day, for at least a month. The individual experiences clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, and other important areas of functioning. So here we have, blessed are those who mourn, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then we have a, a whole lot of complicating factors. What happened to the way things were back when, when it was just so simple? Was it ever? But So the task that I put before the community this morning is to wrestle with this question of what is good mourning? What is good grief? What is healthy grief? The debate and the criticism initially over the APA diagnosis had to do most fundamentally with cultural contexts and the very different contexts in which people grieve and mourn and how cultural contexts inform what is normative for a given person. So to their credit, the APA did make this caveat in their new disorder. In the case of prolonged grief disorder, the duration of the person's bereavement exceeds expected social, cultural, or religious norms. And the symptoms are not better explained by another mental disorder. So that's a mouthful, it's a lot to swallow. They're saying, well, it's, it's normal grief, it's normal mourning, as long as the grief and mourning does not exceed what's expected in your social, cultural, or religious context. Well, this becomes real problematic for us as Unitarian Universalists, because what is the normative religious grief process for us. Do we have a religious norm around grief and mourning? I know we've mourned together in my decade of journeying with you. We've lost people. I think of Ann Beck. I think of Francis Cott. I think of David Bell, Mike McGinn, Howard Garrett. But these are the people I knew personally. But in your own lives and in the times that preceded my ministry here, we've all experienced death and loss. What is normal? What does our religious community have to say about that? Well, if we look into our hymnal and draw from the sources, the living tradition we share does draw from many sources, so we read. Among them, Christian teachings. Hey, and I gave you Jesus this morning. Blessed are those who mourn. But also among the sources we draw from are humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science. So that's where I come in here claiming that the DSM is our New Testament. Well, according to our religious tradition, we take as sources of authority both this and this. <clears throat> 
the truth about good grief, about good mourning, is somewhere in between there, maybe. Let me offer a few other sources to frame our reflection on this topic, and then I want to invite the community to respond as you're willing to share your own experience of good mourning. The classic study of death and dying, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, talks about stages of grief. The first, denial and isolation. The second, anger. The third, bargaining. The fourth, depression or maybe sadness. And the fifth stage, acceptance. And it's not a linear progression. It's a framework, and it's probably more accurately described as a spiral moving towards integrated grief. That is really the language around healthy grieving. We move through these stages, and we arrive at integrated grief. We're not avoiding. We're not denying. We've made this loss a part of our life story and we're able to integrate it and move on. Judith Herman, who wrote the uh, classic book on trauma and recovery, talks about three stages of recovery. Safety, remembrance and mourning, and reconnection. It's beautiful, and, and I, I use this often with my work with veterans recognizing how important mourning is. It's really central into this process she lays out, reestablishing safety, remembrance, and mourning, and then reconnection. And then the third source I found from my bookshelf is this lovely book by a Christian minister called The Unwanted gift of grief, and chapter two is called Everyone Grieves Differently. And there's some wins wisdom in here. Tim Beduvendek, he says there are no authorities when it comes to grief. Actually, I believe that to be true. I'm not up here this morning telling you what good morning is. I'm asking you. He says, when it comes to grief, the authority is the person grieving. I think that might be true. He says, you will journey through grief your particular way. I think that may be true as well. He says, time is not the great healer. What we do with the time is the great healer. And he says, grief is so personal and particular to each loss and each person that the length of adjustment and healing time cannot be predicted. And this is where the real resistance to the APA disorder diagnosis comes in. They're saying, well, six months to 12 months if you're still experiencing some of these, well, you're not blessed. You're actually, you know, got a mental illness. But there are some losses which are so catastrophic, traumatic, it's hard for me to imagine putting a time period on healthy morning. I think of these words from a widow of the Holocaust, a 74-year-old widow who survived the Nazi concentration camps, and she says this, even if it takes one year to mourn each loss, and even if I live to be 107 and mourn all of the members of my family, what do I do with the rest 
of the six million. And of course, we know this is the month that the Jewish community remembers Yom HaShoah, this month that falls on April 27th, a time to remember, a time to mourn. Will our mourning for the Shoah ever end? Should it ever end? So what is good morning? What has been good morning for you? What has facilitated good morning? What wisdom do you have to share with the community this morning? We've all suffered loss. Many of us have suffered the death of a spouse. Some of us have suffered the death of a child. Many of us have suffered the death of parents and siblings. And many of these deaths have come recently and unexpectedly, suddenly, in the midst of this vicious pandemic. How can we mourn well? Because mourning is a universal experience. Loss is a universal human experience. And death is one of the few certainties we have about life. And how we mourn and mourning well matters. Moving through the pain of loss. In this season, the Christians call the Holy Week. It's part of the cycle of life. There's death. There's birth and new life. All played out in the Christian calendar during Lent as we approach Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. Whether or not we practice or observe from the Christian tradition, there's wisdom in the cycle of life, in the morning, and the grieving of loss and of the letting go to make room for new life. I've experienced it myself going through divorce. Another kind of loss many of us have also felt. The anger, the bargaining, the denial at times, Eventually, acceptance, moving towards integration and new beginnings. So what is, for you, good morning? What wisdom do you have to share collectively with our community? this morning.